So, but I want to talk about the positive side of volcanoes today, because uh, I believe volcanoes get a lot of bad press already. So here, volcanic resources is one of my main interests and uh, volcanoes and their underlying magmatic process are uh, the principal agents of redistributing materials within planet Earth. And this is a fundamental realization. They therefore, um, they are a key feature in our understanding of how we concentrate certain um, materials like metals, like minerals, like fluids. And therefore they are cru crucial for us humans that we are living on the surface of the planet. So I'll start with a little list here. So these are all the things that volcanoes do for us. And uh, they bring metals. Most metals are actually from volcanoes. And they bring a lot of uh, gemstones. <clears throat> um, nowadays, we're producing sulfur as a byproduct from the uh, manufacturing of oil. But uh, in the old days, sulfur was exclusively from volcanoes, from gunpowder to disinfection. Building materials are often from volcanoes, abrasion materials, and of course, geothermal power. And uh, I'll say a few words about uh, food and agriculture later on. And if we have the time, we could talk a little bit about climate effects of volcanoes as well. So, but um, one of the things I didn't list is that volcanoes are actually a beautiful way to look inside our planet because uh, Jules Verne described uh, in his famous book, Journey to the Center of the Earth, that Professor Liedenbrook was climbing down into a volcano on Iceland and eventually came out in Italy, uh, implying that there's a system of channel ways under the earth. Of course, we cannot go there, but we can use lava that comes up and we can explore what must be happening inside the earth. And people have speculated about this for many, many hundreds of years. So here's an image of Athanasius Kircher from 1664, picturing some fire inside the earth. And um, we have the surface eruptions. This is on Iceland uh, in the 1970s. That's the Heimei eruption. And if we look at the lava and study the chemistry, we can learn about the processes inside our planet. So much of our knowledge from what happens inside planet Earth actually comes from volcanoes. But uh, I mentioned uh, ore deposits, and I think I cannot stress this enough, that um, most metals that we have actually have been concentrated by volcanoes, have been brought up and concentrated by volcanoes. And here we have some images, and this is Sweden. And uh, Sweden has the biggest iron production and iron reserves in the EU. And uh, they are usually old volcanoes that have concentrated the iron here. And there is uh, some of my students, when uh, we were looking at some of the old mines here in Sweden, and uh, several in uh, central Sweden are no longer active, but um, some of the biggest mines in Europe are actually in northern Sweden. And uh, there, there's active mining for iron, copper, and uh, several other precious metals. So um, here is a, a sample of uh, copper, gold, and silver in its native form. And uh, this is what you get from volcanoes. Only volcanoes can bring that together. So, and uh, most of the metals we use for construction, for our infrastructure, for our IT applications, they come from volcanoes. Most copper comes from the Andes, for example, and similar places, and they're concentrated in volcanoes and porphyry copper deposits. And uh, iron is still the main metal. There's a lot of talk about uh, uh, rare earth elements and things like that, which we need for green tech and high tech applications. But iron is still the metal number one. We need it for making bridges, for making skyscrapers, for making cars. It's so amazingly popular. We will need huge amounts of it. And uh, this is often a volcanic deposit that we're sourcing it from. So uh, several of the more um, new metals, if you will, those that are uh, important for new technology, for solar panels, for batteries and things like that, they are, have also links to volcanoes. This is an image of a manganese crust. And manganese is very important for green tech. And this is from a submarine volcano in the Canary Islands. And uh, there you get this dark layer of material sitting on top of the volcanic rock. And this is from a 
Geomar dredge cruise that I participated in a few years ago. And there you have uh, volcanic dust that settles on these rocks. And this has a lot of cobalt and manganese, some of these really rare metals that we have far too little of and uh, volcanoes are concentrating it. So maybe in the future, going into these submarine deposits, maybe a, a way of satisfying our need for those elements. Now, having mentioned um, precious stones, I mean, we must realize that most diamonds actually come from volcanoes and a lot of other fancy uh, stones come from volcanoes. And um, here I have shown, or I'm showing several types of crown jewels and they have big diamonds. And uh, well, you all probably know diamonds come from kimberlite pipes is a special type of rock. And uh, the biggest ones are in South Africa, but also in Australia and places like that. And there we get these wonderful big kind of um, carbon aggregates that under pressure form diamond. And diamond is super hard. We use it industrially, but uh, we also use it as a, as a gemstone for jewelry. And once it's cut, then uh, they look rather wonderfully um, uh, shiny. But uh, well, as you probably heard, usually there's also a negative kind of curse or something like that with the big diamonds. So uh, I guess it's designed to make people not so greedy. Now, having said this, I think we must realize that some of our oldest tools for mankind also go back to volcanoes. And uh, here obsidian volcanic glass has been used by humans as long as we can think as uh, tools, for example, and uh, places where uh, iron, for example, or metals were not known uh, prior to European um, um, conquest, um, people were using obsidian like in New Zealand or on Hawaii, or um, for instance, in the Canary Islands, people were using obsidian to make blades. And uh, this is still very, very popular today. Some surgeons still prefer obsidian to actual metal blades because uh, obsidian is super sharp and makes a very clean cut and it heals a lot better, some people say. So you might find that uh, some surgeons prefer obsidian to steel blades to this day. So, and here's just a few examples from uh, Turkey and also from uh, Central America about uh, ancient uh, cutting tools made of obsidian of volcanic glass because it splinters in this really sharp way and people have been exploiting this feature for hundreds to thousands of years. Now, having said this, I think uh, we also must accept that uh, volcanic material is widely used as abrasion material. It's less glorious, but uh, we're using it in industrial applications um, as well as in uh, human hygiene applications. So pumice material is it's highly porous, it's high silica, so it's quite tough and it's often glass rich. And this uh, is very good for scrubbing things. And uh, you will actually find that a lot of cosmetic products have volcanic material in them. So here, if you look at the small print in the um, top left, it says uh, uh, ground pumice stone is part of this um, body care product. And um, several of these products here have pumice stone as a fine kind of material in there. And there is even a Krakatoa body scrub. It's um, going to help to remove uh, old skin. And uh, this is effectively just volcanic rock finely milled. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, if you have a, um, a toothpaste that is supposed to make it make your teeth very white, you will actually find that there's usually a little bit of pumice in there as well. So some of you will get in contact almost every day with pumice and uh, therefore with volcanoes, you might not even be fully aware of that. So, and uh, if your jeans that you're wearing uh, has uh, a stone washed kind of element, if it's worn out a little bit or so, usually this is done with pumice stone. Uh, stone washed jeans comes from pumice stone. They tumble it together with uh, volcanic rocks and it uh, grinds down the material. So uh, here also your clothing might have touched volcano at some point. So having said this, um, we all eat from um, plates usually, and um, this means porcelain. And porcelain is also made of uh, different components. It's usually made of granitic rocks, uh, subvolcanic rocks. 
So here we have quartz and feldspar, and I'm showing a big feldspar in the lower uh, left here. And um, um, you also use clay for that. And if you mix this together, it makes this paste that you can then kind of model and burn. And um, it took many hundreds of years for us in Europe to work out how it's done. The Chinese were a lot quicker with that. And uh, by now, there is uh, many, many companies that, uh, of course, make porcelain. And it's very hygienic because you can clean it. And uh, this is a real advantage over, for example, wooden plates and things like that. So it's still widely in use. And of course, nowadays we make tiles and things like that because we can actually clean it effectively. Now, I mentioned sulfur earlier and um, up to um, about 100 years ago, when sulfur started to become a byproduct um, from uh, oil refining and particularly since uh, environmental uh, regulations in the 1980s became more stiff uh, and a lot more sulfur had to be taken out of petroleum. Um, we have loads of sulfur from fossil fuel production, but prior to that, sulfur had to be mined. So gunpowder had volcanic sulfur in it. And um, as you might know, if you are um, having, for example, wine in barrels, you need to disinfect the barrels once a year. And for that, you also use sulfur. And um, this is still widely used. So I found this product here from, uh, from China, the Shanghai sulfur soap. It's um, very good if you have bad skin, apparently, then you can use that. It cleans up your skin. And if we are going off fossil fuels in the next, um, I guess, 50 to 100 years, we will actually run into a new problem. We will have to quarry sulfur again from volcanoes because the byproduct will also not be available anymore. If we don't produce fossil fuels anymore, then uh, we might need to go back to quarry sulfur. So here's some sulfur mines that are still active in Indonesia on the left-hand side. And the top right is an old abandoned sulfur mine in the Andes in Chile. And uh, several of those will have to probably pick up more production once our electrification of the traffic has progressed a little bit further. So now geothermal power, this is something that uh, is very popular. And Iceland, for example, has a lot of very cheap energy because of the geothermal power, but also countries like New Zealand, like uh, Indonesia, like the Philippines, they also uh, can harvest um, geothermal power. I now heard that uh, El Salvador is um, doing Bitcoin mining with uh, volcanic clean energy. So, and they have just admitted this as um, a legal tender and uh, they believe they don't harm the environment because they use volcanic geothermal energy, which is kind of happening anyway. And um, this is the concept of a geothermal power plant in the top left. We are close to a heat source. Water gets heated up, it converts to steam, and steam expands in volume, and then it will rise up and we can drive turbines with it. Or if you want, you can even use it for direct heating. In Iceland, for a long time, um, geothermal waters were used for direct heating. And when I remember back the days when I first visited Iceland, I was in this hotel in Reykjavik and I opened the um, water tap and suddenly there was this smell of sulfur in the room and uh, it was actually volcanic heated water and they didn't kind of uh, clean it. It was just there and uh, uh, it was a bit of an awkward smell like uh, rotten eggs. Uh, I didn't feel it was particularly pleasant. They have now um, changed the system a bit. They still use it for heating this water, but they don't use it for hygienic purposes anymore. But I should say that uh, there's a lot of metals and other substances, minerals dissolved in geothermal waters and the pipes clog up very quickly. And there's an image in the lower right-hand side from New Zealand. This is a clogged up pipe after a few months uh, of um, geothermal fluids running through these pipes they actually get tighter and tighter. And uh, what the people in New Zealand do is they take the materials in there. There's actually a lot of silver and gold in there. And uh, this is a very useful resource as well. Now, here's a few impressions. This is a big power plant in Indonesia, a geothermal power plant in West Java. And uh, here is a few more impressions from Iceland. And you might or might not know the Blue Lagoon, which is a big bathing spot on the Reykjans Peninsula. It's actually a byproduct of the geothermal power plant there. 
which is the main power plant that supplies Reykjavik. So um, all the extra waters are kind of uh, put into a basin and then people go bathing there. So uh, it's actually kind of wastewater, if you will, but uh, it's full of these minerals and therefore it's very healthy. And um, here, as you might see, um, a lot of um, electric energy is generated on Iceland. And uh, then uh, there's a few other things, greenhouses are heated with that. And Iceland actually produces more bananas than most other European countries because of this free energy that the volcanoes bring. Now, um, this is at the Blue Lagoon. Last time I was in Iceland, I couldn't uh, help but take a few pictures. Uh, they're selling the kind of uh, minerals that are dissolved in the water from the geothermal power plants for cosmetics because they're good for your skin. And uh, they're selling it particularly to Asian visitors. They seem fascinated by this concept. So uh, here, a lot of people would actually use cosmetics that comes from volcanoes. Having said this, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the minerals that are dissolved in uh, waters, volcanic waters. And this is likely to be very, very important for us in the future because what we need for electrifying the traffic is one particular element and that's lithium. Lithium is uh, very kind of soluble in hot water. And this is why a lot of the waters in the Andes where there's a lot of volcanoes they have a lot of lithium and uh, in the Atacama Desert where these pictures are taken, where the water then evaporates, you get these salty crusts. This is not snow, this is all salt here in these images. And uh, these have a lot of lithium and boron, which we need for making batteries at the moment. So a lot of it is harvested there. And here's a few more impression how it's harvested. And uh, they have these large salt lakes and um, it's um, um, a renewable resource in the sense that uh, more and more of this water is expelled and evaporates and produces things. But one problem is that if we over harvest, we will reduce the groundwater table in these areas. And many of the local indigenous communities are not very happy about that because the Atacama Desert is very dry. So if we are artificially depleting the groundwater level, then uh, these local populations might actually get into trouble down the route. But we need something on the order of over 900% of the lithium that we are currently producing. So it's almost unthinkable that we cannot mine these things. We will have to quarry them if we want to electrify the traffic until 2050. Huge amounts of this will be required and it's the volcanoes that are producing it. So um, this is the key point I wanted to make for electrifying traffic and many other IT applications. We need these elements. And uh, while on the one side, there is a lot of opposition to mining and quarrying, on the other side, many of the new green tech applications require metals and uh, elements that come from volcanoes, and we will have to go and get them. But having said this, I'd like to uh, say a few words about uh, volcanic stones as well. And I guess one of the earliest forms of our use of volcanic stone is to actually dwell in it. And here's a few images from the Canary Islands where people have uh, made caves. And this particular one was probably a grain store and not something to live in. But um, people have made these little shelters and stored grain in there prior to uh, the days where we had uh, you know, the infrastructure to store this properly. This is high in the mountains. It's very dry. It's sheltered from rain. So it was easy to protect because there was only one way to get to it. And uh, this was likely a very efficient grain store where surplus from harvests could be stored for years that were less good in terms of harvesting. So here people have managed to actually get by over not so good years by using volcanic rocks for storage purposes. And uh, of course, they also lived in it. And here's some of these caves. This is called the King's Cave, uh, the one on the left. And uh, I went inside, it's kind of spacious. I mean, it's uh, fair enough to live in, I guess. And uh, some of these caves have been converted to restaurants. That's the picture on the right-hand side. So you can actually go inside and have a meal there in the Canaries. So this is almost a tourist attraction, but the caves go back to pre-Spanish times. Now, this is uh, Cappadocia in uh, Turkey. And uh, there, 
we have seen uh, for a long time that uh, uh, people have been dwelling in volcanic rocks. It's easy to carve. And people have been building on volcanic rock. And uh, here's a few examples from Scotland, from Austria, and from France. Um, volcanic rock weathers very badly, and uh, therefore it often sticks out. And then you can build something on top of it. And the Romans have pioneered this. They have uh, started to make cement from volcanic materials that are particularly chemically reactive. And therefore, they have uh, um, built rather wonderful architecture with volcanic stones and the porcelana cement. Now, volcanic stone has been used in many, many cultures. Here's a few more pictures from Indonesia. And uh, here, um, some of the temples in central Java around Merapi volcano, and they all built of volcanic stone. And this goes on. Here is um, a little church in Arico village in Tenerife. And uh, this is quarried close by from volcanic rock that has erupted from uh, the volcanoes in Tenerife. And um, this is still used today in uh, many of the building applications on the Canary Islands. It's a very popular stone because it has little vesicles, it has bubbles, so it's good for insulation, but it's not too dense. So, and this is true, of course, in other parts here in France, in Clermont, we have volcanic stone and in the Eiffel, the vol uh, volcanic um, district in uh, Western Germany. There, we also use uh, a lot of these volcanic stones and uh, they are good for building tall buildings because they're not too massive. And at the same time, they're very sturdy. This, of course, can be used for grinding purposes as well. This is a form of abrasion, if you will. Millstones from the Eiffel have been sold all over Europe for many hundreds of years. The Vikings imported millstones from the Eiffel, for example. And, um, and you can see in the archaeological record that it wasn't perfect for their teeth. It also grinds down your teeth if you have too much of it in your food. But it's certainly effective to grind corn and other cereals. So here as a cladding stone, volcanic rocks are extremely important. And um, then uh, I'd like to move on as a concrete supplement, as an aggregate. It's also extremely important. And uh, the top image is in Indonesia where people are quarrying volcanic particles to put into concrete and uh, also on the fields. And then uh, there's some houses here in Las Palmas in the Canary Islands. and. Uh, they are made from uh, Portland cement that has a large proportion of volcanic particles in it. So I would say about 30 to 40 percent of this image is actually made of volcanic particles, although you don't see it immediately. So here's a few more impressions. And um, a good thing here is that uh, when they quarry this in Indonesia, they also create these uneven surfaces. They quarry this purposefully chaotic so that if there's new material coming from the volcano, it creates a sediment trap. It will slow down lava or ash clouds when they travel over this irregular surface. So here they get the material and they can actually ensure that the next eruption will be a little less problematic. 